Hey, welcome to Marketing in the Raw. This is the podcast. My name is Adam Hellway, and I am the host, and I am so glad that you were able to join us. Um, today, we're going to be talk, 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 talking. I'm, I'm going to be talking. If I can talk right, we're going to be talking about content marketing. Uh, one of my favorite topics and uh, probably one of your favorite topics to learn a little bit about and who else better to learn about content marketing from Robert Rose. He is one of my favorite, if not my favorite person to learn about content marketing from. Uh, I have been listening to his podcast uh, along with Joe Polizzi uh, called PNR. Um, they stopped it for a while. It was about a year or two, and then they just brought it back. So don't go there yet, but I do recommend that you listen to that podcast after you listen to this one. Let me tell you a little bit about why this uh, discussion is different than what you're used to. We're not going to go into like, you know, how to repurpose this and do that. And what's the best format for content marketing and you're putting your content on here and there. That is not what we're talking about here today. Um, what we're going to talk about is two truths. No, no, two lies and a truth about content marketing. Uh, and, um, these are definitely more strategic, uh, and not, uh, not only that, but the, the stuff that Robert talks about here is really important to reframe how you think about the role of content within your organization and elevate how the, function of content and the people within the organization that drive the production of content, the strategy, all the things related to it, um, the, the role that they play amongst all the other things going on within the organization. Um, content is an asset. It is something that has equity that it can build up. Um, and when you look at content differently as well, overall, an overarching uh, for, with, with an overarching strategy versus sort of individual one and done pieces, there's so much power to be had in uh, in that content. Um, so uh, Robert shares some really great stuff here, uh, and I hope that it gets you thinking a bit differently about what role content plays in your organization and uh, how you can make content way more profitable than you ever thought you could. Okay. So without any further ado, here is the interview with Robert Rose. Robert Rose, how have you been doing? I have not talked to you in quite some time. You've been doing all right? I'm doing great, my friend. It is also great to talk with you. It's We do not get to talk in person uh, nearly as often as we should. Well, it ends up usually being uh, in, in passing at you know one of the many conferences. And uh, I actually was looking at some old uh, old video from IDW where I actually had a chance to, to interview you, just like we're going to be doing today. IDW. Wow, that's a classic one. That, I mean, that's, that's, that's some OG stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and you guys just also had the, I think it was the tech uh, content tech conference as well. We did, yeah. We just last week finished up um, uh, CMI's content tech event, which is basically our reboot um, of the origin story. Um, of what we're talking about when we talk about content strategy with, for, for years. In fact, for 10 years, it was called the Intelligent Content Conference. And we relaunched it this year with, uh, for the first year with a new name called Content Tech, um, which is really the, the, whole, you know, the whole story behind that is for years, we've seen intelligent content strategies to be a shining star on a hill. It's the thing we're all striving for. And what we really wanted to focus on was, okay, how? How is the path created up the hill toward the star? And truly, it's through people, process, and technology. And so we wanted to create a wonderful conference to educate people on the technology, the governance processes, and certainly the people skills of getting to a better content strategy. And, and so this was our first year. Well, awesome. On, on the note of content strategy, I want to propose a game, you know, here with you, which is uh, two truth, two truths, uh, no, two lies and a truth. We're going to actually spit t tell more lies than we are truth. Two lies and a yeah, truth. Is find the point? truth. Find the truth. <laughs> uh, all right. So I'll shoot some at you and then you tell me if it's a lie or if it's a truth and why. Okay. Okay. All right. So the first one, content marketing is cheaper, faster, and more efficient than traditional campaign-based marketing. And that is a lie. That is a lie. Now, no, why it is, is that? 
Well, here's the thing. And it's and it's something that we see a lot out there, which is, you know, I mean, and and God bless the folks that are out there trying to make the argument that that content is actually more efficient. It, 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 and in some cases it can be, it, you know, there's, there are certainly cases out there where a piece of content has ended up being a much more efficient, um, method than, uh, than, than, uh, than advertising or a catalog or, or something like that. However, having said that for the vast majority of people creating content, distributing content and getting eyeballs on content is certainly just going to be harder. It's going to be harder. It's going to be longer and it's not going to be as efficient because here's the thing, creating a piece of content is just inherently more difficult, you know? And so when I, and when I say content, I mean, what I mean is content that is valuable in and of itself. So it somehow provides inspiration, education, entertainment. It is valuable despite the product or service that it may be ultimately supporting. And so if you're creating content as a product that is value, uh, valuable in and of itself, it's just harder. And if you don't believe that, go talk to your agency. If you're, you know, so you go ask your agency and you say, hey, I need an ad. And the agency is going to go, great. We've got a guy with a big beard and he wears a TAM and he goes down to Starbucks and he types on a typewriter and he's the hippest guy you've ever met. And he's going to create your amazing content uh, ad. And then they come back with three versions. I don't know why it's always three, but it's three. And you get the three versions and one of them kind of meets the brief. And then the second one is really just way out there. It's going to be what they want to win a con line award for or something like that. And then the third one is, yeah, kind of what you asked for. And then you're going to do the thing that they always hate, ad agencies always hate. You're going to go, well, can I have a little bit of two and a little bit of one and just mix them up together to make four? And then they're going to talk bad behind your back. They always do. And then what happens is that the agency does it. You know, they sort of give up. They give you the fourth one and you go, yes, that's what I want. And they send you a bill. And now go ask them for a piece of content. And then the first thing they're going to say is, well, how good would you like it to be? Because if you want it really good, you know, like with thought leadery kind of stuff in it and like, you know, subject matter experts, it's going to be super expensive and take a long time. And we're going to have to really put an effort into this and it's going to be, you know, big price tag. But if you just want like the top five reasons you need aluminum siding on your house, well, we've got a freelance writer who can put that together for you for five cents of a word. And so that's the key is, is that creating content that is valuable is just more difficult. And thus, when you're building an audience, it takes longer. And you have to promote it to the same extent, if not even more than you would a traditional ad or a catalog or a brochure. So it's just, it is not more efficient. The real magic of it is, of course, that it can provide much more value than a traditional ad or a brochure or a catalog because you can build an audience with it. That's the, that's the true benefit of a, of a content marketing approach. It, it, it reminds me of a conversation we were just having recently. We, we, we brought on a new client and one of the, the, the biggest activities that we're, we're doing with them is content marketing and, and the content creation and strategy around that and so on. And uh, when we have the initial conversation with the client, it, 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 it's very easy to put sort of, yeah, this is what we're going to produce from a, from a sort of deliverable standpoint. But within there is there, there, there's a subtext of sort of like quality, like you're saying, and, and the, the um, it's kind of like ordering food. Content is a very broad word. And without getting into those specifics, it can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And obviously, there's 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 different value to, to different audiences depending on how that content is developed, and, and just as you were describing. And so that's the the piece that we uh, we're just having a discussion on recently about how to make sure that we can keep the content to the to the standard that we need it for this particular client, but also within scope because everybody's usually got to deal with those things, right? We only have so much time and, 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 uh, and money to invest into this. So how do you um, set the right expectation to make sure that the, the, uh, the work that you're going to have to put into this, this piece of, of content, that's just not just a deliverable because we want to have one blog post a week, or we want to make sure that every quarter we have one ebook, but we have content that actually fits a broader strategy that is meant to really, provide uh, an actual value, not just check a box off of something that's, you know, a list of, of deliverables. Yeah, that's the critical piece, right? I mean, the key is, is in any good content strategy, you're outlining a program where you're not just, pro you know, you're not just producing 
you know, random acts of assets. And what you're rather doing is feeding into an editorial strategy that's building toward something. And the key piece there, and you said it very well, which is looking at not just doing something ad hoc to feed a blog post every week or to feed a white paper program or whatever it is, but actually creating that thematically connected experience for the customer so that blog post number one is more valuable because blog post number three and five and seven exist. And blog post number five and seven and nine are more valuable because blog post one and two and three exist. By creating that, it makes content work so much harder for you than it, than it otherwise does as just singular assets that are out in the universe somewhere. You're trying to tell a story. A great example of this is we worked with a, a software company and they were like, we want to write the definitive guide on our business, right? On our industry. And I said, fantastic. And they said, yeah, we're going to release it as a blog, you know, over the course of the next 12 months. And I said, that's lovely. That's fine. I said, but write the book first, write, you know, create the book, create the most comprehensive. But if you want to truly create the most comprehensive book in your industry, write the book, release it however you want to release it. Because what inevitably happens is, is you have this idea to say, I'm going to create the most extensive, wonderful, comprehensive book in my industry. But then three blog posts in, yeah, life gets in the way and you can't really meet the next deadline. And now you're going to reprioritize and all that kind of stuff. And so it lay, lies fallow there and ultimately dies on the vine. And so by writing the entire book first, one is that it makes you make the book cohesive. It makes the entire thing cohesive. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three are more valuable because there is a chapter four, five, six, and seven. And so you can link back, then you can link backwards and forwards. So no matter where anybody comes into the story, they can either go back to the beginning or they can go toward the end and skip ahead and you've already got it thought out. Release it, distribute it however you want, but create it as a connected, you know, a, a totally connected experience. Isn't that the uh, the beauty of the the Marvel movies, the, the, the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe, right? Well, that's yeah, it's exactly it, right? I mean, I know you and I are both huge fans, but that's the, that is truly the difference between DC and Marvel. Now, not to get too geeky here, but that is the difference. DC is releasing ad hoc random assets that, yeah, some of them are okay. Some of them, most of them are quite mediocre, and some of them are real stinkers. But none of them are connected, like in any sort of meaningful way. Marvel had the whole arc pretty much created from the very beginning. And the only thing they had to do was execute against all these movies. And now they're at a place where everybody is waiting to see the end game, as it were. And each individual piece still stands alone and, 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 yeah. and, and provides a valuable experience in that sense. But if you, if you see it in context, it, 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 uh, it, it or if you see, you know, uh, if you understand the connected element of it, uh, it reinforces all of them. Um, so, so let's go to the next, let's go to the next thing. You tell me lie or truth. Sure. Uh, content marketing is best when it supports other internal marketing and sales campaigns. So the content team should be constructed like an internal agency within the organization. Right. And that one is also a lie. Um, and here's the reason why for that. So this is something that we see a lot at, uh, at uh, you know, with our consulting and advisory clients where we see content teams that are new and they're starting up and they're supporting the entire business, right? So you've got, you know, it is not uncommon for someone to come up to me at a workshop and say, you know, hi, my name's Bill. This is my colleague, Margaret. And we're it. We're the content team for our business. And we support sales and demand gen. And we support the CEO and the VP of marketing when he wants a video done. And the PR group for their newsroom and the blog and the, you know, the HR even with internal comp. We do, we do all the content, right? Hashtag all the things. And, <laughs> and they ask, their question is like, how am I going to scale that? And I say, you can't stop trying. And so... The key there is, is that when these nascent content teams are getting started, and we're seeing this more and more, there's this idea of the growth of the internal agency where you've got internal people that are basically built to support you know, various you know, parts of the organization. There's internal creative teams, there's creative technical teams, creative you know, marketing teams, and many times these internal agencies are getting labeled as such. And, and ultimately, when the content team gets that, 
they end up being the kinkos basically of the, the business, right? Their job is simply to be an on-demand vending machine of content assets, just like we were just talking about. Where we have seen success is where that relationship is flipped. Content and our communication, our story, just like we're just talking about with DC and Marvel and all the other stuff, it should be leading the business, not following the business. And what I mean by that, and this is, a, you know, you're getting a bit of personal opinion here on this truth or lie. That's what I'm looking for, but, man. Yeah, but the personal opinion is content should be as strategic a function in our business as legal, accounting, sales, marketing, et cetera. Nobody goes, nobody goes, hey, that, le you know, the legal part of our business, yeah, they're just really an internal agency. And we, you know, and, and then, you know, when the legal folks come out with some finding that, you know, the rest of the business should comply with, nobody goes, well, let's get, let's socialize that a bit. Let's see what marketing thinks about that legal find. No, nobody does that. Legal is a strategic function in the business there to guide us through legal issues. Content is as complex. It is as uh, a, a, an important as function as legal or accounting or any function in the business worth investing in. And thus, it needs to be leading that charge, not being a follower of that charge. So anytime I work with a content team that is you know, structured like an internal agency, I, I try and sway them away from that as hard as I can, certainly marketing leadership. Now, the other part of that, of course, is supporting internal marketing and sales campaigns. And of course, it should support internal sales and marketing campaigns. Of course, content has to do that, but it should do that from a proactive stance. We have a concept that we call content merchandising, which is once there is a proactive sort of forward-looking content strategy, editorial strategy, yes, then out of that comes smaller assets or individual assets. And hopefully, maybe, possibly, we need to work through and work with our colleagues to figure this out. Maybe that covers 50% or 60% or 40% of the total output that we need to support internal marketing and sales campaigns. For that that doesn't, let's recognize that. Let's go, okay, yes, 30%, 40%, whatever, is going to be stuff that we can't account for. You're going to need an infographic. You're going to need a new case study. You're going to need a VP of marketing, social corporate responsibility video. So we will account for that too. But dividing up our time as a strategic team between the strategic content we're creating and the merchandised assets that we're actually producing for the rest of the business. That's the way a strategic content function operates in a way that scales. A balance, a balance between the between the both of those, and 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 probably setting the right expectations up front, so that way exactly, you're, exactly, you're... and the balance is up to the business, right? You know, I'm not here to prescribe whether it should be seventy thirty or sixty forty or thirty twenty, you know, and and you know whatever it is, but some find basically the key is recognizing and acknowledging the balance. That's the real critical part, you know. It's the it, it's it's being able to say with some authority, no, you have now exceeded your limit of what it is we're going to be producing from an ad hoc on-demand basis. And you're not complying with our guidelines and our best practices in our playbook, which is taking time away from us spending time on the strategic blog or the strategic publication or whatever, you know, the resource center, whatever it is we are writing other content for. We have to have that. If we, if we look at it that way, we have to have the time to be able to spend on it. How does one, how how does one, uh, how does one uh, managing content or the, the folks that that are that are driving content reposition themselves in that way? And I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, it doesn't. It's very similar to sort of the sales and marketing communication challenge. And in many cases, marketing in, in in general, you know, within organizations, positioning themselves again, not like a. A, uh, a producer of merchandise, so to speak, in deliverables, but uh, of, of some a group that is driving marketing internally within the organization and is actually adding value to the bottom line, not just uh, making pretty things, so to speak. So how does that, it's a lot easier to say than do to get somebody to position themselves within the organization in a more strategic role. How have you seen folks make that turn or, or communicate uh, well, so that they are able to maybe draw some of those boundaries. They're able to to produce the merchandised content yeah. as as well as the the strategic content. 
Totally. I mean, and, and, and I couldn't agree with you more. It's really easy for you and I to sit here and talk about DC versus Marvel. And it's an, it's another thing for, you know, a, an actual content practitioner to, to facilitate this kind of change. So the first thing is one, just, let's just, let's just, you know, let's recognize the elephant in the room, which is there is a cultural change that has to occur. And the smartest strategy, the, you know, the highest paid consultant, whatever, is rarely going to have any kind of impact without that cultural change. There just needs to, ha- and there has to be some cultural change to say and recognize that we're going to get strategic about content. And if that happens, if we can make that case, if we can make the case that you know our boss has our back, or we've got a business case, the data is showing, or we just you know the CEO has a gut feel for content marketing being a thing. Great. Now we've got permission, or now at least we have, you know, some runway to be able to say what's the actual change that needs to occur. And the biggest one, quite frankly, is finding that balance to be able to, you know, supply the organization as best we can with those merchandised assets to say, here's what the organization needs. They probably are asking for way more than they need, which is one, you know, thing. So, Let's do a content audit. Let's figure out what's working. Let's really get a good structure in place there. The second thing is, what are the strategic initiatives that we as a content team would take on? Would we have the time to do so? You know, would we take on a resource center? Would we take on a blog? Would we take on a, a you know, a, a customer experience, you know, digital magazine, whatever it is? What would we take on? And what would it demand of our time to actually be able to operate that as a, you know, as a fully functioning operation? Figuring out that balance of where, you know, and having it shift, you know, because start small. We worked with one organization that literally started with 90% of what they were doing to supply the organization with merchandised assets and 10% of their time focused on strategic content. And their goal over two years was to lower that to 60% and 40%, right? So that's the real key is that this is a process that can happen over time as you start developing more st- strategic initiatives and value for the business. The second thing is then to get really buttoned up with the way that those content requests are coming in. Really get buttoned up about an intake process, best practices, guidelines, briefs, whatever you know your team needs to get really a good workflow and governance solution so that it's not just random emails, hallway conversations, Excel spreadsheets, et cetera, getting passed around that says, hey, I need another, I need another PDF or hey, I need another infographic or hey, I, where we have no real insight into the cost, the number of agencies that are involved, all that stuff, getting really buttoned up or just getting our arms as a team around the content production process and having some authority to say, stop the madness, because every time we say no, Joe goes off and hires some random freelance agency to do it for him anyway. And so getting that great governance and process, getting the strategic initiative balanced, and then finally, most importantly, getting the cultural change, um, at least permission in place to really make this change. That echoes a lot for, for, for some recent experiences with a, with a, with a particular client, uh, but I was going to even tack on to that second uh, thing you were talking about uh, when it came to um, sort of getting a hold uh, of the process. Like if you can't lead strategically on, on the strategic content you're doing, at least initially, at least you could lead by owning the process to make it more efficient in, in like you said, the production process of the content, the the, I mean, if you can't get a hold of that, A, you're never going to make the margin that you need in order to, you know, to, to get that time to do the strategic stuff. And, and B, you're almost always going to be at the behest of, of them. It's, it's, it's usually going to be something like we have a, a sales call next week. We need to produce this piece of content. We have this going on and, you know, we need actually a couple new slides for our sales deck. So it becomes more of a um, somebody's got a fire and you need to react to, to be a part of that, you know, firefighting team, even though you've got a lot of other things to, 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 to deal with. So if you can create a process where you can get ahead of those fires or create a system or something that allows folks to, to be more, um, self service, I guess, in some instances, then that can, then that, then that can help you. But going back to what you said, sort of, uh, at first also, is we, we witnessed this uh, again more along the lines of sort of marketing, but marketing from a 
perspective of, of the, 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 uh, the content producer in the organization and um, the, the folks they were dealing outside of that department, specifically sales in, in this instance, were really focused on their thing, right? Whereas marketing might, might be looking at the entire customer journey, you've got folks in, that are really looking at the, the part of the customer journey maybe that they are really focused on and don't really care about all the rest of that stuff, can't even get the context, uh, you know, wrap their heads around the, the rest of that stuff. So if it, it, sort of stopping, stop, you know, to stop providing them the content that they need, full stop, isn't going to win over um, any any sort of cultural change as you were referring to earlier, <laughs> no, right? Definitely not. Yeah. Um, yeah, de definitely not. I'll, I'll just tell you one quick thing, sure. which is, you know, just just to your point, you know, that alone can be a business case for creating a content marketing and content strategy. That just simply that alone. In fact, we have a client that we're working with right now where they're not going to try and do any strategic initiatives. They're, you know, it, certainly at first, they're not trying to get, you know, ahead of themselves. They're not trying to get, you know, any, you know, publications out or anything like that. Literally the first, they've, they've just put together this content team. Their first goal is quite frankly to make and socialize across the company that they are content. In other words, they want to reduce, they, they currently have relationships with about 18 or 19 different agencies that are producing everything from landing pages to pre, you know, briefs to white papers to blog posts to infographics. They're trying to reduce that from 18 down to about two or three. And then quite frankly, even just get a common nomenclature when they look at the accounting, like the account, the CFO will send them a list of content expenditures, you know, and sometimes it's called an ebook, and sometimes it's called an e-magazine, and sometimes it's called a white paper, and sometimes it's called a digital experience, and they have no idea how much they're spending on any of these things because, quite frankly, they don't even have a common nomenclature for managing those costs. So their whole goal in this first year is simply to become the center of excellence of content control the production process so that they quite frankly just get their arms around the cost and alignment and saving the company money on the content production they're already doing. It, it's funny because all this that we're talking about goes back to the first lie, which is that content marketing is cheaper, faster, and more efficient than traditional campaign-based marketing. We, we're sort of talking about a number of reasons why that's the case beyond what we, what we stated at the beginning because of, of a lot of these challenges that folks end up uh, also running into uh, when it comes to running it within their organization, right? Um, yeah. So we did two lies. So it's pretty obvious that the last one is, is, is the truth. And uh, so content marketing can be a profitable part of any business. That's a really general statement. So let's dive into that a, a little bit and, and explain why with all the stuff we, we covered before, why it's still worthwhile and, and, and can add value to an organization to, to do content marketing and have all those things in place to make it successful. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously the topic of the, the book that Joe and I wrote together. Um, and, but it's, it, it's, you know, sort of profitable meaning a, a, a broader in the broader sense for sure. But even in the, you know, most literal uh, of senses, you know, the, the key with content marketing is, as we talked about in the beginning of the show, is really, it, you know, if we look at it like a product, if we look at it much more like a product development methodology where we are building platforms, we are building thematically connected experiences to actually add value to our consumers' lives, well, then we can start to look at the measurement that that provides. And we typically look, and we don't have to go in for the sake of time, go into all of the different you know, ways that we look at measuring audiences across the business. But if we just sort of look at them from a category perspective, one of the ways that we look at it certainly is that it needs to provide multiple areas of value. In other words, by looking at content producing just as an asset, the only thing it will ever do is be measured by how successful the campaign was in promoting it. In other words, if I produce a blog post and the only purpose of that blog post is to supply some demand generation marketer with a demand gen asset for them to post paid media to or you know, promote on social, that's, that will be the end-all, be-all value of that particular 
uh, content asset, which of course is going to, the reason number one is a lie. The key is, is that we need to build those audiences because they can be monetized in multiple ways. One of them, of course, is yes, better leads, faster leads, the Glen Gary leads, whatever you want to look at it. <laughs> but in many cases, they can make the audience, you know, they can make the company smarter. You know, there are, there are great examples of companies that are creating content marketing platforms for no other reason than that it helps everything else they're doing. You know, Adobe with their CMO.com is a great example of that. CMO.com, you go sign up for CMO.com, you're not getting put into a lead nurturing funnel. You're not getting sales guys who want to crawl into bed with you and spoon you at night. They're not, they're none, they're doing none of those kinds of things, right? They are just like providing that? you what if you valuable, like valuable <laughs> assets. And the, the key is there, they're, you're learning. Now, why would they do that? Because through polls and surveys and looking at the content consumption and looking at A-B testing, it helps them develop better marketing materials, more efficient, effective marketing materials. So for them, it's a cost reduction calculus on the rest of the marketing that they're doing. And there are other examples just like that. And if you take that all the way to its extreme, you can even make money out of this. You can make cash out of this. You know, extreme examples of this are, of course, Salesforce, right? Salesforce, it has Dreamforce. 175,000 people go to San Francisco every single year, pay for the privilege of doing so and celebrating all things Salesforce. And it's a wonderfully event-driven, content-driven experience. And of course, they're doing that to create evangelism, to create loyalty. You know, it's a total loyalty content marketing experience. But they're making money. Do it. it is a profitable part of their business. So I've seen some estimates that have said that if they just pulled Dreamforce out of Salesforce, the asset would be worth a billion dollars. Imagine that. Making an asset in your business a content marketing asset that's actually increasing in value over time as you draw in more subscribers and could actually be one of the most profitable parts of your business. But it doesn't even have to be like a huge, you know, a huge company. You know, you often think, oh, it's got to be Red Bull or, you know, it's got to be Kraft or it's got to be Salesforce in order to do that. But of course, there are tiny little companies doing this as well. But one of my favorite examples of this is um, Trish Witkowski who's a solopreneur and she folds paper for a living. And I mean, literally folds paper for a living. Her whole business is as a consultant teaching direct mail companies how to fold really interesting direct mail pieces that, you know, that marketers can, can send out. Well, she created a YouTube channel and a series of videos that um, sort of every week she has what she calls her weekly fold. And her weekly fold is, has so many subscribers now that she's been able to monetize that with sponsors. And so now she's getting sponsored to create content that creates consulting clients for her. So it's marketing that actually pays for itself. This is the entirety of how we go to business at Content Marketing Institute, right? Every marketing program we do from the event to our print magazine, to our webinar program, to our blog, is all a marketing, um, uh, you know, a marketing tactic given to making people want to come to our big event, which of course is content marketing world. But every single one of the aforementioned tactics also make money. They and also, you know, they building that minimum viable audience, right? I mean, you, you guys, are, I love that you brought that up. That's exactly right. It's figuring out what your minimum viable audience is. Um, you know, thank you, Seth Godin for that. And, and, you know, and, and, and basically looking at what it is you need to be able to monetize that audience in the most effective way that, you know, helps your business. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because even like with this podcast, I mean, we, 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 we we're just launching the podcast. It's our first few episodes. I say we, myself and the team at, at Secret Sushi, uh, but it's something I miss doing. And, and one of the things that really has changed uh, compared to, to, to previously when I did the podcast co-hosting with folks like Janet Bouts and so on, is that we really are looking at it as part of a larger ecosystem of, of, of interactions that we're doing through content with, an, with, with hopefully an audience that we're growing, a community that we're growing. We, 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 we certainly don't need the, the business perspective per se, uh, you know, of hundreds and hundreds of people from, from as, as far as our business model goes in our current state. 
But we know that there is value in building that audience up for other things that we might be able to 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 leverage and in interacting with folks in in helping folks in different ways than we might do it right now. We don't know what the possibilities are just yet. I mean, we've tossed some around and that sort of thing. Uh, but 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 truthfully speaking, I mean, a lot of it has to do with over the years listening to you and Joe on the podcast and really um, uh, the way that you frame as you just did. Uh, content in such a different way, it, you know, as a mechanism for building an audience and and then getting value from that audience as well as giving value to that audience in ways that you might not have uh, anticipated or thought of because you're you're very much thinking of that transactional thing. Are we going to get a lead on that one blog post A or blog post B? When when just like the Marvel movies we talked about, right? They built an audience, an audience so large that that audience wants to be along the entire journey with them. And I'd sort of argue to say that, you know, in addition now to the movies, you have the opportunity to do things like licensing and all kinds of other stuff that creatively speaking, I've heard you guys frame before ways that an enterprise B2B company could also do something very similar without quite thinking about it, without without it seeming as such uh, initially. Um, with a little creativity, there really are some interesting ways that you can get value, like you were saying, the data that helps to inform other things that, you, uh, that you're doing elsewhere in the organization or things that you're gonna be doing in the future so that you're able to actually accelerate yourself ahead of the competition who's not doing any of that, right? They're, they don't have the insight, they don't have the data, they don't have that mechanism that, it, it, that helps them understand their customers better, understand possibly new products that they could go ahead and and produce or new services that they could roll out because they've actually uh, made content is not just a transactional thing, but something that provides them some insight into their customer along with uh, a, a larger pool of, of dedicated you know human beings and customers and folks that they, uh, they get to engage with um, regardless of if those folks are plunking down money at that point, right? It's well, it's an amazing thing, right? <clears throat> the the you know what you're talking about is 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 you know it's something that we've seen for decades in in the entertainment business, right? So when Disney comes out with now Star Wars dolls or you know or <clears throat> anything, you know, anything Pixar related, you know, when Lego comes out with, you know, it's Lego, you know, um, movies, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen, we've seen the entertainment business merchandise things and, you know, and everybody goes, yes, of course, of course they would do that. Of course, HBO will sell game of Thrones t-shirts and will sell all sorts of things. Of course, Disney will sell Elsa dolls and frozen mugs and all sorts of things. Of course they would do that. We would, we would never expect anything else. Flip that around and you go, we start looking at product companies who start mediaizing if they're, you know, well, their assets and everybody goes, Whoa, that's, that's weird, right? You know, it should not be weird for us to see down in the future, General Electric, for example, launch the world's first free university, right? That rivals Harvard or Stanford or any of those. Why wouldn't they? Why couldn't they? Why couldn't we see Starbucks acquire something like USA Today and become the natural provider of a daily newspaper. You know, all of these things seem and feel weird because of the cultural sort of shift and trust and where everything is right now with consumers. But we are starting to see it. You know, we are starting to see, you know, you see companies like Raspberry Pi, right? You know, a wonderful computer components for DIY um, hobbyists. They've just recently purchased two magazines, one around home being a better home photographer and the other about being a DIY computer kit maker. Those, they're not going to stop selling advertising. They're not going to stop doing sponsorships. They're not going to stop monetizing those magazines as they have been. But they're also going to start using those as wonderful assets in their business to help the rest of their marketing and make sure that, they're, you know, that their audience, that their consumers are entertained, informed, engaged, et cetera. It's all about how do I build an audience that I can teach how to be customers? Um, an audience that they can teach how to be customers, a little bit like the, uh, uh, what is it? Teach somebody how to fish and then sell them a fishing pole, huh? Yeah, that's exactly, or, you know, teach them, teach them how to be a customer, right? 
teach yeah. them how to be, you know, teach them how to be a more valuable customer. That's one of the best examples I've ever, you know, seen, you know, so you look at somebody like Lego, where we just mentioned, you know, Lego is the, the most amazing thing about Lego in the Lego movie is it, w- the, the Lego movie was not built, made in order to introduce you to the Lego brand. The Lego movie was built for Lego fans to make them want to buy more. And that's the real key. And that's why the theme of that movie was so great. You know, parents and kids working together. And sometimes you can go out to the lines. And sometimes, you know, working in teams is good. But sometimes working alone is good. All of those themes that were in that movie were all about inspiring you and entertaining you at the same time and teaching you that parents and kids should do more stuff together with, and in this case, Lego. And so it was totally a, you know, a return or a loyalty type content program, not to introduce you to logo but, or Lego, but to rather convince you to buy more. And of course it did. Well, I, I, I miss the heck out of your podcast because I always love to hear uh, the stories like that, where you remind us of, of things that are, that haven't just happened in the last decade, but you know, the, this old marketing stuff, stuff that happened much, much farther back. And, um, and that, that have, that have taken people that have brands that have taken marketing and really done a lot of what we were just talking about and that have been doing it for a long, long time. A lot of folks that we forget like Jello and, and, and John Deere and a number of, of other ones uh, from back in the day. And, and so uh, I think if, if, and I believe your podcast is still up and there may be some sort of current events that may be a little less current these days if they listen to it. But I still think that there's a lot of really cool examples of things in there and, and if, you know, uh, if there's a, if there's anybody that I know that I would consider a, you know, a visionary when it comes to technology and this and that and the other, I, I really definitely, um, you are my visionary for content. I've, I've really always appreciated the, the insight that you've had on those podcasts and the books. Um, I'd love actually to have you back at some point so we can talk a little bit about content experiences and experiences in general, because um, really that your, your book on experiences, uh, was, uh, was one of my favorites when it first came out. Uh, and I think you do a really incredible job of, you know, synthesizing that stuff down in a way that, uh, that makes sense for organizations. Well, you're very kind and your check is being sent. I'm, 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 I'm Venmoing you my money right now. <laughs> and, and, and so what can uh, people do? I, I know you're always doing all kinds of great stuff to continue educating folks on on just what we talked about here, content marketing, content strategy. Uh, you've got workshops that you do all over the place. I mean, you're always, hey, this is my office and you're some country, someplace, you know, doing that stuff. Where, where can people find out more about um, how, to, how to interact with Robert Rose and learn more? Well, you are very kind. Uh, you are very kind to ask for that. Um, so, the, the, I mean, the key these days is uh, our, our consulting and education website, which is contentadvisory.net, um, where we, you know, me and my team, we run around the planet, as you say, and, and work with brands of all sizes to help them figure out the operationalizing of, of content, just like we were talking about. And, um, and, and yeah, and then, of course, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Content Marketing Institute. And content marketing world, of course, every September in in the lovely, lovely downtown Cleveland. All right, sir. Uh, I appreciate it. And I hope uh, we can have you back. And thank you so much again for, for taking the time. Always a pleasure, my friend. Always. Thank you so much for having me. Wow. What an episode. Like totally worth the price of admission, huh? What am I talking about? It, it was free. Okay. So look, this is how you can get my back on this now that you're at the end of the episode and everything. And I, you know, I know you want to, you want to pay me back for all the great information that we shared, go to wherever it is that you normally find podcasts, look for this show marketing in the raw, that's the name, and then click the subscribe button. That would be incredible. We'll be square. Everything will be good. If you want me indebted to you, then leave us a review or a rating wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. It helps a lot of other folks find us, folks that are interested in these topics. And, you know, you wouldn't want to be greedy, would you? Uh, Last but not least, if you'd like to connect in any way, you can feel free to email me. I'm Adam Helway. You can email me at adam at secretsushi.com. Or you can go and check out what it is that we're doing at the agency at secretsushi.com. All right. Take care. Take care.